Good morning. My name is Pastor Joel Shears, and I'm the pastor of Sunnyside Christian Reformed Church. And once again, it is my privilege to welcome you as we worship God on this Sunday morning, this second Sunday of October. And so thank you for joining me. As the weather starts to change, it's a reminder of the changing seasons. It's also a reminder of the fact that we serve uh, an eternal, unchanging God. And we serve a God who is not only constant and unchangeable, but also a God of grace. And our call to worship this morning is from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where we read this, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And a reminder that we serve an eternal God, but we also serve a God of grace, a God who has shown us grace in and through the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and the hope that we have in and through the power of the cross and the victory of the resurrection. And in just a few minutes, Jamie and Jansen are going to lead us in the hymn, Amazing Grace. Uh, after I announce the offering and we spend a few minutes in prayer, they will lead us in that song. And then again, they will lead us in worship after the message. Our, our offering this morning is for the SCS Help Fund, uh, a fund to help those who struggle with Christian school uh, tuition. Uh, just a, a tremendous uh, opportunity to, to help those who are uh, sending their kids to Christian school. And so uh, prayerfully consider sending in your checks or giving online to the SCS Help Fund. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and unite our hearts and go to pr God in prayer at this time. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we turn to you this morning, and as the weather begins to cool, we are reminded of uh, the changing seasons. We are reminded that even as uh, spring and summer turn into fall and winter, that you, God, are eternal, that you are unchanging, that you are everlasting, that you are God. It is also a reminder that we are not. Father, we are, we are human, we are broken, we are fallen, and we are, we are a people that need your grace. And this morning, we acknowledge the need for your grace, the amazing grace that you offer us through Jesus Christ. Father, this morning, in the quietness of our own hearts, we confess to you our sins. We confess to you that uh, we have often done and said and thought things that we knew were not pleasing to you, and yet we made the choice to do them anyway. And so we ask for your forgiveness. Father, there have been other sins that we were just unaware of, and we just uh, blindly plowed ahead. And Lord, it is a reminder that uh, we are all blind in some ways. We are all lost. And so we need, we need the amazing grace that you offer us in Christ. Uh, and we simply need to receive it in faith. Father, uh, this morning we come to you and, and during this time of pandemic, as it continues on now into uh, the autumn and fall, uh, Lord, we are tired and weary. And yet, Lord, we know that you give us strength and the ability to persevere. And so we pray for that. We pray for those who uh, struggle with anxiety as we talk about that this morning. We pray for those who are, are filled with a sense of loneliness. We pray for those members of our congregation who are struggling with grief because of the recent uh, death of loved ones. And we pray for those who are struggling with a sickness, illness, injury, or surgeries. Lord, uh, there are so many, and, and so we pray for your healing. We, uh, we pray for those who are receiving cancer treatments, and we ask uh, that you would bring them healing. Um, Lord, uh, we just pray for your, your grace in those physical, tangible ways. Father, after we, uh, after we sing about your grace, uh, we are going to open your word, and we pray that you would bless it to our hearts and souls this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Jamie and Jansen. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, uh, the verses 12 through chapter 4, verse 1. And I'll give you just a moment to find that in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 3 uh, through chapter, chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 1. And once again, you'll find it projected uh, on the screen uh, to your lower right. Paul writes this. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in Every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. All right, this morning we are going to look at finding joy in anxiety. And we've been working through the book of Philippians and we are up to this, this part where Paul actually uh, talks about and deals with the topic of anxiety. And it's an incredibly relevant topic for us because many, many of us deal with worry and anxiety. Uh, maybe, maybe you're not the kind of person that is a natural worrier, but you have times. You have times where you're just filled with worry and anxiety. Something happens and, and you're just filled with, with, with worry. If you're a parent, you, you often worry about your children, and there's times where you're, you're filled with anxiety. And maybe some of you are natural worriers, and, and, and you go through life just always kind of worried about this or that or the next thing, or just filled with a sense of, of anxiety or even dread. And, and during this pandemic, during COVID, I know that, that there's been a lot of additional anxiety because uh, 
the times are just so uncertain and we don't know what the future is going to hold. And so that just brings with it uh, a sense of anxiety uh, for so many of us. And so as we go through life, uh, often, often there are things that we are just worried about or filled with anxiety over. And Paul addresses that head on in this passage. And it's actually an incredibly practical passage because he gives us four ways to overcome anxiety in our lives. Four very, very practical ways to overcome anxiety. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at those four ways that he talks about. We're going to jump right in this morning and, and look at the first one. And the first one is be patient with others. Now, you might say, but what does that have to do with anxiety? Let me explain. He's going to, we're going to address conflict in just a minute because Paul uh, talks about some of the conflict happening in the book of, or in the church of Philippi. And, and then he, he talks about what to do about that. And what I want you to see is that often the cause of anxiety in our lives is conflict with others. If, if we are in conflict with someone else, oftentimes the result of that is, is we just are filled with a sense of anxiety. Many of us don't like conflict. Many of us would, would rather avoid conflict. Why? Because it creates anxiety in us. We're like, well, we don't know what, what's going to happen or what that person's going to do or how, how to respond. Or, and it often fills us with anxiety. And so what Paul says here, he talks about how to deal with that conflict in a healthy way. And the result will be less anxiety. Listen to what he says. He says, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Because right now they're not of the same mind. So try to be of the same mind. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, to help these women <clears throat> since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So, so what is Paul saying here? He's, he's, it, well, let me point out something. It's very, very interesting because one of the things that Paul does here is he calls out these two women publicly. Because many of you know that epistles uh, like this book, the book of Philippians, was an open letter to the church at Philippi. And they would have read this on a Sunday morning or at a worship service. And, they, and, and so whoever read it would have read, all right, Yodia and Syntyche, you need to get along. You need to be of the same mind. And can you imagine if, if, if we did that today? I mean, what if there were two women in our church that weren't getting along? And, and you know, I was preaching a sermon and I called it out. I'm like, hey, you, know, you know, Bonnie and, and Betty Jean, you two have been fighting and you need to get along. I think most people would be shocked. Most of you would be like, I can't believe he called them out in the middle of church. I mean, and yet that's what he does. That's what Paul does here. He, he calls them out, but for a very good reason. He says, listen, that, that conflict between the two of you uh, is likely causing co anxiety with you, but also in the church body. It's also affecting other people. So we need to deal with this. I'm pleading with you to be of the same mind. Like to, to try to agree, to try to see it the same way. And it's just so important because in the church, in the church that often, it often happens that, that people will not be of the same mind. They won't agree. Some people will say, well, I think we ought to do it this way. Well, I think we ought to do it this way. You know, this is a good ministry, but I think it ought to be implemented this way. I think it ought to be implemented that way. Or, or sometimes they just disagree in the terms of, of the ministries in general. Like, I think we ought to have this ministry and the church ought to go in this direction. Well, no, I think we ought to have this ministry and the church ought to go in this direction. By the way, as a side note, it's one of the reasons that a vision for a church is so important. And our vision committee, our vision team has been working on a vision uh, that will be going to our council. Uh, and one of the, the, the purposes of that is so that we're all on the same page, all in the same mind, moving in the same direction. It's just so absolutely important for a church that, that the church is moving in a direction. The ministries of the church are, are, are all supporting that vision of the church instead of just going in different directions. So Paul says, listen, be of the same mind. Just, uh, try to agree with, with one another because you are part of the same body, the same church. And, you know, just as an example for today, uh, you know, I, I think this is really relevant just in terms of timing because, you, you know, you could, you could make the argument that, that Yodia was a, an always masker. 
and Syntyche was a never masker. That Yodia thought, you know, it's really important in a time of a pandemic to, to wear a mask. Because you don't know if you have you don't know if you have the COVID or not. And so it's it, it's your duty as a Christian. To, it's your way of showing love to others, to making sure that you don't infect other people and bring them to harm or, or, or even, uh, you know, give them uh, this, this sickness. And so it's just really, an, it's, a, it's the Christian way to show love to others. You just put on a mask so, so that you're safe to others. Well, why wouldn't you do that? If you're a Christian, why wouldn't you try to protect other people from getting sick? Then on the other hand, you would have Syntyche who would say, well, wait a minute, I think that whole mass thing is kind of government overreach. And I think they're, they're trying to get us to live in fear of something that we shouldn't be living in fear of. And, and we should be living in faith and trust. And so, uh, you know, a, a good Christian is going to follow Christ and, and live in, in faith that God will take care of them. And so I don't think we should ever put one on because it sends the wrong signal that we just don't, we live in fear and that we don't trust God. And, and so you, you have two different views and that's what we have in the church right now. We have two very, very different views. And, and I think one of the Paul, things Paul would say here is, is, listen, try to be of the same mind. Try to at least see each other's point of view. In fact, he goes on and he says this, and this is really important. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident. Now, the word gentleness here is one of those words that I think is an unfortunate translation in, in the NIV. It's one, another, another area where I just kind of take issue with the translation because the word gentleness in the Greek is a word that literally means uh, gentleness or forbearance or patience. And I think that patience is a much better translation here because you have these two women uh, that are disagreeing, that are in conflict, that don't see things the same way. And Paul is saying, listen, be patient with each other. You know, try to, try to be of the mi same mind. Try to agree. Try to at least see each other's point of view in this. And, and be patient with each other in this. Because what do we tend to do when we disagree with somebody? We tend to be impatient with them. We tend to get angry. We tend to you know, argue. And Paul's saying, listen, be patient. Be patient with each other. Try to live in peace with each other. Why? Because as he just told us, both of their names were written in the book of life. They were both Christians, they both belonged to Christ. They had both received the grace of the cross and had life eternal through the power of the resurrection. Their names were written in the book of life. And Paul says, listen, you both love Jesus. You just see this differently. And so be patient with each other. Be patient with each other and, and, and try to see each other's point of view in this and live together in peace. Why? Because you both love Jesus. And yes, you may see it this way, and you may see it this way, but, but try to come together, try to live together, see each other's point of view, live in peace, because again, your citizenship is first of all in the kingdom of God. And, and, and so I think the, the, the lesson is just so, so clear to us today. Whatever they were arguing about, we have our own argument here, and, and, and there's different people on different sides of this, and, and I think the words of Paul are, are very clear. It, maybe, you, maybe you believe, you are a Christian who believes that we ought to wear masks all the time. And, and maybe you're a Christian who thinks, no, we should never put them on. But live in peace. Be patient with each other. Try to, try to find points of agreement. Why? Because you both love Jesus. And both of your names are written in the kingdom of God. And so that applies to mask wearing. It applies to, to just so many different things in life when we find ourselves at odds with other Christians. And again, uh, when we find ourselves in conflict, what happens? We find ourselves filled with anxiety. But when we can be patient with one another, when we can live at peace, when we can try to dialogue and, and try to understand each other and live in that, then one of the great benefits of that, Paul tells us, is that uh, it, it, it reduces our anxiety. We, instead, we have peace because we have peace with others, and so we have peace in our hearts and in our souls. Paul goes on. 
And he says, trust in the presence of God. So the first is be patient with others and, and try to live in peace with others, and that'll reduce anxiety. The second thing is trust in the presence of God. Listen to what he says. He says, let your gentleness be evident at all. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. God is present. If you are worried or anxious about things, understand something. God is near. He is present. He is here with you. I mean, this is such an important promise to understand that God is present with us. That the Lord is near. This is one of my, if somebody's going into surgery, this is actually one of my favorite passages to read because, you know, when you're in a hospital room uh, and, and you're anticipating surgery, it's, it's just such a sterile environment and it doesn't, it doesn't seem like God is near. And so I like to read this because it's a reminder that, listen, God is, God is here. He's in, even in this place, God is near. This is the promise that he made to us. When Jesus on the Great Commission, he said, I am always with you to the very end of the age. God is near. Whatever you are going through, whatever kind of worry or anxiety you are going through, understand that you're not going through it alone because Jesus is with you. Listen, one of the hardest things about facing a challenge or, or, or being worried or anxious about something is, is the, the prospect of going through that alone, like, oh, I'm in this by myself. But when we know that we're not alone, it just takes away so much of the anxiety. And that's why Paul says, listen, trust Trust in the presence of God. God loves you. He has shown that through the power of the cross and the victory of the resurrection. And, and he is with you through his spirit, the spirit of the living Christ. Third, Paul says, pray and petition with thanksgiving. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to see something about this, because this is, you know, oftentimes when we face worry and anxiety, we do pray. We go to God and we say, God, I'm worried about this, and, and, and please take this burden, or, or fix this, or, or give me what I need, or, or take care of this problem. And, and that's our petition, right? We, a petition is asking for something. And so often, that comes naturally. If we face worry and anxiety, we petition God. God, please meet this need. Please take care of that. But what Paul adds to this is petition with thanksgiving. Like when you go to God, go with a thankful heart for the, the blessings that God has provided. When you look around and, and you're worried about something, you're God, I don't know what's going to happen. Go to him with a sense of thanksgiving, but I am grateful, God. I am grateful that you are with me. I am grateful for the grace that you have given me in Christ Jesus. I am grateful for the fact that you have given me every spiritual blessing there is in Christ Jesus. I am grateful for the blessings that I have. I'm grateful for the way that you have taken care of me in the past and been faithful to me in the past. I'm just grateful. And, and so, yes, I'm asking for this, but I'm asking uh, with a sense of gratitude for the blessings that you've provided and, and, and when you can focus on that and, and understand the blessings of God and go to God with a grateful heart, then there's a sense of peace that comes out of that because you start to remember that, yeah, God, I'm asking you this, but I'm also just grateful for, for everything that you have provided and, and the way that you have been with me in the past. And so, yeah, I, I, I trust in your presence and I trust that whatever I'm asking for, you will meet my needs. Now, that may make sense, but we're going to take that to a deeper level a minute. Because the Heidelberg Catechism adds something. In, in verse, uh, Lord's Day 10 of the Heidelberg Catechism, it actually says this. It says, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, fruit, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty. All things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. Now, you put this together with what Paul is saying here, and one of the things that we also have to do when we petition God, and, and this really gets to a deeper, more mature level of Christianity, is to be thankful even for things like sickness and poverty and difficulties. Why? Because ultimately God 
allows us to go through those things so that we will be strengthened, so that, that he, will, he is able to bring us to maturity in Christ. <clears throat> excuse me, in Christ. Do you see that? That, that when we are facing anxiety and, and worry because we don't know what the future is, is going to bring and, and, and maybe we're going through uh, times of difficulty and hardship that we actually pray to God and, and ask and petition Him to meet our needs, but with a sense of thanksgiving, not only for the blessings that He's provided, but even for the difficulties that we are going through. Now that seems pretty counterintuitive, and yet, yet that's what we're called to. And so uh, let me ask this question. How many of you have thanked God for this pandemic? How many of you have, have said, God, you know, please, uh, I'm worried about this. Please meet these needs. But I, I thank you. I thank you that we've gone through this, even this time, because I know that you are at work. I had a, there was a dear saint uh, from a member of this church stopped by this week to talk to me. And she made that comment. And she said, you know, I thank God, even for this pandemic, because I know that God is at work in it. And he's teaching us stuff. And he's teaching us things that we, we need to learn as, as the church and as a nation to get on our knees and, and, and to call to him. And she was absolutely right. We can even thank God for a COVID pandemic because of what he is doing through it. Now that takes perspective and that takes faith, but that's what Paul is talking about here. And, and when you can do that, that, there's a peace that comes from that, a peace that passes understanding. Our, our hearts and our, our minds are guarded in Christ because we understand that, that he is at work. All right, and the last thing that I want to point out is that he says, think about positive things, okay? Uh, Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. All right, this is, this is a, again, this is interesting to me. Back in 1952, a man by the name of Norman Vincent Peale, some of you may recognize that name, uh, wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. And in that book, he said this. He said, the way to happiness, keep your heart free from hate, your mind from worry, live simply, expect little, give much, fill your life with love, scatter sunshine, forget self, think about others, do as you would be done by. Try this for a week and you will be surprised. Now, those are all great things. And I've heard Christians say, well, yeah, you know, this, this idea of positive thinking, I mean, it's just Christianity light, and, you know, that's just, uh, you know, I don't have any time for that. But what I want you to see is, is that there's a very good reason Paul calls us to be positive, to think positively. I mean, there's a reason that he lists the things that he lists. And let's just go through them again. He says, you know, if, if, if there are things that are true, think about what's true. Don't focus on lies. Think about the truth. Think about what's noble. And, and another word for noble here is the word honest or honorable. Think about what's honorable. Fill your mind with those things. Think about what's right, what's just, and what's fair. Don't think about everything that's unfair in this world and how you've been treated unfairly. Think about that which is fair and just. Think about that which is pure. In other words, which is clean or, or chaste. Don't think about things that are, are sinful. Think about what is lovely or, or beautiful. Look around at the world and the beauty of the world that God has created. Think about that which is praiseworthy. Think about that which is excellent. We are called to live uh, doing all things excellent for the sake of Christ. Think about what's admirable or commendable. And why does Paul say those things? Why does he say, listen, fill your mind with those things? Because our minds are like vacuums that just, just love to, to be filled with negative. I mean, it's our, it's our natural fallen state to immediately think the worst and to start worrying and to be filled with all of the things that could go wrong and, and all of the negative things in the world and all of the, and just to think about those things and to dwell on those things. And of course, when we think about those things, we're going to be filled with anxiety. And so Paul says, listen, but what you have to do is you have to take the conscious, make the conscious choice to think about these positive things. 
to put your mind on these things. And it's one of the main ways to reduce anxiety. If you're always thinking about the negative and the terrible things that could happen, well, yeah, you're going to be filled with anxiety. But, but if you trust in God and you, you focus on what God has done in Christ and, and the fact that he has, he has offered you grace through the power of the cross and the victory of the resurrection, like you can, you can focus on the positive and the life that you have in him. And so, so it, just in summary, just in summary, Paul tells us a couple of things here. He says, listen, first of all, if, if, if there's anxiety in your life, maybe it's caused by a relationship. Maybe either you're in conflict with somebody over some, something. You know, try, to, try to be like-minded with that person. Be patient with that person. Trust in the presence of God. Understand that God is near. And that you're not going through whatever you're going through uh, alone or, or whatever you will go through, you're not going to go through it alone. The Lord is near to you. And, and, and pray, when you pray, pray with a sense of thanksgiving to God. Not only for all of the blessings, but even, even for the difficulties because you know that even in those things, God is at work and that he's shaping you and that he's present with you and he still loves you in Christ. And then, and then think about, just think about, focus on, on the good. Go through life, make that conscious choice. When you're tempted to be filled with worry and anxiety, make the choice to remember that, that Jesus loves you. And, and think about the good, the redemptive that God is doing in the world around you because there is so much that is good and praiseworthy and excellent and beautiful. Think about such things. So I'll leave you with this thought this morning. Be patient with others. Trust that God is present. Pray with thanksgiving. Focus on the positive, And then you will be able to do what Paul says in verse 4. Instead of being filled with anxiety and worry, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let's pray. Father, we turn to you this morning. We pray that our hearts uh, would be filled with joy and not worry and anxiety. Uh, because we know that you love us in Christ. Father, thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the grace of God, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen. Onward we go, for still we hear them singing. Jesus bids you come And through the dark Its echoes sweetly ringing The music of the gospel leads us home Hear, O oh my soul Angelic songs are swelling O'er earth's green fields and the ocean's wave-beat shores Oh, how sweet the truth that those blessed strains are telling Of that new life when sin shall be no more Jesus 
sounds o'er land and sea and hear laden souls by the thousands meekly stealing kind shepherd turn their weary steps to thee of the songs you sing above oh until morning's joy shall end the night of weeping and life's long shadows break in cloudless love onward we go Sweetly. Re-